Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to church. It is amazing to have all of you joining us here this morning. For some of you, you, you know me and you've seen me and we have interacted together for many, many years as we have gathered as a church. For some of you, you only know me from seeing me on your screen and I thank you so much for joining us here and joining us in this church and being a part of us. I want you to know that once you begin to join us online, it is like you are joining us here in person if we could. And so know this, that you are part of our ohana. You're part of the family. And we are overjoyed to have you. If you are joining us online, this is new for you. And I ask, please take time to go to firstnazarene.ca and send us an email just to say, hey, I've, I've been joining you and just enjoying the services just so we know and we have a connection point. Maybe you can put a message on Facebook to us. Please feel free to do that as well. Uh, we would love to hear from you uh, that are joining us online. You are part of us and we are just so thrilled. Let's pray. Lord God, Savior King, we love you. We know that the church is larger than these four walls. And Lord God, we could be joining together here in this place. We could have been doing that, Lord God, but we know that there is so much going on out there that we want to create the safest space, the, create the safest way that we possibly can to worship with one another. And so, Lord Jesus, you have created this amazing opportunity that we could go online and that the words that you are speaking, Lord Jesus, through your word and through the praise and worship time, Lord, are being pushed far beyond the borders of these walls, Lord, and we praise your name for that. We thank you for all of the new believers and for all of the newcomers who have been a part of our family now, God, we thank you. Lord, we just enter into this time of praise, that we sing with our whole hearts, Lord God. Lord, that we listen to your word. Holy Spirit, you have been speaking since the dawn of time. And so we are so thrilled to know that you will be speaking to us here today. Fill our hearts in your name. Amen.
my heart find strength in your presence And I'll walk through the fire With my head lifted high And my spirit revived In your story And I'll look to the cross As my faith your glorious grace let the ruins come to life in the beauty of your name rising up from the ashes God forever you reign and my soul will find refuge in the shadow of your wings I will love you forever and forever the ruins come to life in the beauty of your name rising up from the ashes God forever you reign and my soul will find refuge in the shadow of your wings I will love you forever forever I'll sing
This is the moment in our service where we just take a, a time to pray, just us and God. After that time, I'll, you'll hear my voice come in and I'll, I'll lead us into prayer as a corporate body, as a, as a family. But I think it's important that we just take a moment, just us and God. Maybe it's something that we have to clear up with him. Maybe it's just a moment of silence to listen because he has something to say. Let's just take that moment now.
Lord God, we love you. We come together as a corporate body, Lord Jesus, to pray. We know that you hear us. We know that you have answered prayer for this church and for churches throughout our city, throughout our province, throughout our country, and then throughout the world. You continue to listen and to answer. And God, we thank you for that. We pray now, Lord Jesus, for the Skiba family, Lord Jesus, who have lost a mother and a grandmother, Lord Jesus. God, we pray that you will just give them comfort and hold them close. We thank you for Mrs. Henderson and all that she has done in your name, Lord Jesus. She was truly a graceful servant of yours. And so we thank you for the time that we got to have with her. We thank you for the 99, just about 99 years that you gave her, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Lord God, we pray that we as a family will continue to hold them up and be with them, Lord Jesus. We pray for all of those who are not in the best condition that they have ever been, Lord, that they feel aches and pains, where maybe some have had diseases that have entered their bodies that they don't want, Lord, but they have no choice. So, Lord Jesus, we just lift everyone up to you. We know that we cannot control this. We can't just shout and scream the aches and pains and hurts and, and diseases away. We can't do it, but we can come down on our knees, put out our hands, and give them to you. And you, and you alone, will be able to take care of everything in your will and in your love. And we thank you for that opportunity. We love you, God. In your name, amen. I want to thank all of those who have continued to give to the church uh, in any and every way that you have. We appreciate it. We thank you. The church continues to function and to move forward. Oftentimes, we might believe that because the building isn't being filled up because people are coming into the building that the church maybe isn't doing anything. But that is not true. The church is continuing to push forward. The church universal and the local church here is continuing to do everything we can to bring the gospel to people, to bring love, gentleness, hope, peacefulness to those who need it. And so we thank you for your generosity and your continuing to give as it has been written in the word to do such. If you are new to us and would like to give, you could go to firstnazarene.ca and there gives you every option you can uh, see as far as how to give online. If you would like to give in a physical manner, please email us. Again, go to firstnazarene.ca and you'll be able to find the email there. You can email the church and be able to uh, ask us to come and pick it up or how you can give. And we'd be thrilled to answer any questions you might have. God bless you and thank you. All right, kids, let's talk. Over the last little bit, we've been talking about emotions. I talked to you a little bit about how we all have emotions, that that was a gift of God to be given to us, and that it's okay that we have them. Then we kind of started to talk about specific emotions, and we started with anger. And we talked about the fact that we all get angry, that these things happen, but it's how we deal with that anger that's really important. And we talked about different ways that we could deal with that. Today, I want to talk to you about an emotion called sadness. You know, we all get sad. Even in the Bible, it talks about Jesus and how Jesus got sad. The shortest verse in the whole Bible is this. Jesus wept. Shows that Jesus, well, he got sad. 
and he cried. I want you guys to know this. It's okay to cry. It's okay to sit down and take a big breath and just let tears come down your face. It's okay. We all get sad. We all need to cry. God gave us this wonderful ability to cry. We also need to be able to talk. Be able to go to somebody, a mom, a dad, a grandma, a grandpa, a brother or a sister, someone that we trust and that we love, be able to tell them, I'm sad. You might not even know why. There's times where I don't know why I'm sad. It just happens sometimes. And that's okay. Sit down or lay down or wherever you want to be the most comfortable and cry. And then you pray. You say, God, I don't know why I'm sad or God, this is why I'm sad. And I know that you are listening to me and I know that you love me, God. Help me now, Lord, as I finish up my crying, dry my tears, and know that tomorrow is a new day. Lord God, I thank you for every kid that comes to our church. Lord God, I thank you that you allow them to just be sad sometimes. Sometimes there's a really good reason. Sometimes there's no reason at all. But it's okay to cry. And what happens after crying is the most important. And that's praying. Lead our kids to be able to pray to tell someone that they're sad and to tell you that they are and allow you to comfort them, hold them, love them. For if they learn that now, Lord, oh, what a wonderful life they will have. In your name, amen. God bless you, kids. Okay, so we're still in Acts. Acts chapter 16. We're going to kind of finish off the story that we have started. We find ourselves in the house with the jailer. The jailer has become a Christian, has been given a promise that his whole household is going to become Christians. And so Paul and Silas go with him to his home. It is there that they speak to the family. The promise that God gives comes to fruition. This whole family comes to know the Lord. He serves Paul and Silas. They, they eat something. They are refreshed and renewed. And then they make their way back to the jail. They do this so that the jailer won't... Uh, won't be put to certain death because he has allowed them to leave their jail cell and to be with him in his home. Magistrates probably aren't going to understand. And so they go back to the jail where they await uh, what is going to happen next. And so we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 16, verse 35 and 36 is where I'm going to start. If you're new to the Bible, Acts is in the New Testament. So if you flip to Psalms, which is right in the middle, and you just continue to flip to the left, you're going to find yourself into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the Gospels. And right after that, you're going to find Acts. So you just keep flipping in Acts until you find the big number 16, and then the little number 35, which is where we're going to pick up. If you have a tablet or your phone, you can go to any Bible app, type in Acts chapter 16, verses 35 and 36, and it'll take you right there, and you'll be able to join us. So I'm going to go to the Bible now, and we're going to read Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 35. Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 35. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer, With the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. It's interesting that at this point we see that the magistrates just appear that morning. 
ever as pompous as they are, they call out, you may release them. You might wonder, well, why would they go through all of this just to release these two individuals in the morning? Well, they do this to show an intimidation, to terrorize the population, to look at the population of people and say, look what we can do. We can take these two individuals and we can arrest them for really no reason as we can do to you. We can beat you, we can imprison you, and then we can just release you to tell the tale to everyone that you can tell it to. And there's no way that you will ever know why we did it and when we are coming. And so it takes this population of individuals within the city and puts it under the magistrate's thumb. The magistrates are are practicing terrorism against these individuals. It was that kind of intimidation that we see throughout history. And we see it, and and more so for you and I to be able to talk about today, we see it in relationships where one person will be angry. The other individual will not quite understand why they're angry or what has been done to cause that anger. And then they, they stop talking. Sometimes we call it the cold shoulder or, or the freeze out, where you are trying to say anything and do anything, begging, crying, and finally just accepting the fact that this silence is happening. And then all of a sudden, when they deem that a sufficient enough time has gone by, they talk like nothing's ever happened. They release you without an apology, without a reason why. And that slowly drives you into submission. They assert their control over you. We've seen it so many times in so many relationships and I believe that probably most of you who are hearing this here today know that this has happened to you. Know that it's happened to you on one occasion, two occasions, hundreds of occasions. Maybe it's happened with a friend. It's happened with a wife or a husband, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, maybe with your children or your parents. But you know the scenario in which I'm talking. It's brought to my attention that, especially because I work with a lot of young people, that it happens a lot uh, in, in junior high and in middle school where a group of friends will just decide that they're not going to be friends with the other person. The person never understands what they've done or why this is happening until that group of friends decides, oh, well, okay, we'll be your friend again for no real reason, and it's only so they can assert control. It's not good. If you're somebody who this has happened to, I'm sorry, and I want to talk to you about God and what submission really means. If you are hearing my voice and you know that you've been a party to something like this, It's time to ask for forgiveness, to change, because this isn't how God wants us to behave. You see, when God talks of submission within the word, he is talking about the relationship between him and us. And that relationship is in terms of love and respect. God loves us and respects us. And because of that, he generates a relationship between us and him that is built on that love and respect. And in that, there is a submission that is shown from us to him and him to us, where he says, I submit to you that I I love you and I would do anything for you. And, And we do the same for him. It is in that understanding of submission, that understanding of what our a relationship with God looks like that we can then find ways and seek out relationships that are the same as that. 
God does not want any relationship to have one being the domineering individual and the other a submissive individual. He does not have that with us where he is domineering over us or he is, he is waving his power over us and therefore we submit because that's not the relationship God wants. If it was, then that's the relationship God would have. God would assert his power over us and we would, under sheer fear and emotional terrorism, give to him the love that we have, though it would not be real and it would not be true. It is the same as the relationships in which we seek with one another. He does not want us to be in any, any relationship that would be gained submission through physical or emotional terrorism. This comes the first point of the sermon here to say, seek out and maintain God-led relationships. Let me say it again. Seek out and maintain God-led relationships. The amount of family and spousal abuse that takes place in relationships is staggering. If you are a believer, then God is the head. And that headship was given to him through our permission in granting him access to our hearts and into our lives. He did not kick down the door of our hearts. He knocked upon that door and we answered it, allowing him to come in with our permission. And therefore, we relinquish the control and surrender of our rights to him. And in that way, we, involve, we begin to involve ourselves in a relationship with him. And that relationship then should be mirrored in all other relationships we have where we can recognize that with our experience in God and who he is, that is the experience in which we should have with one another, where we can be honest, where we can have no walls, where we can submit ourselves to them and them to us in a godly way. That is what we are seeing here take place between Paul and Silas and the jailer. You see, after the earthquake that takes place, which has nothing to do with Paul and Silas, that earthquake was purely for the jailer. It wasn't for them to escape. It was for them to enter into a relationship with the jailer, a relationship that modeled the relationship that they had with God. And so they create a God-led relationship with the jailer. However, with the magistrates, that relationship is different. As they are being called forth by the magistrates that morning to be said, hey, you can come out now. They assert their birthright that says we are Roman citizens. They do such to correct the wrong that was done and to make balanced what was imbalanced in the relationship. We find that they need to say, we are Roman citizens, so that the magistrates will shift their position and there will be balance restored. Now we know that individuals who do not recognize Christ in their lives, like these magistrates did not, that that balance that they are striking at this place is tenuous at best. And we know that in our own personal relationships, when we are exploring and being a part of relationships with people who do not believe in God or, or who have not surrendered themselves in totality to God, then there proves to be a tenuous relationship with them as well. However, it is for us to continue to seek out those relationships, even though they are tenuous at times, because it is through relationship that the saving grace of God is found. More often than not, it is relationship where somebody is loved and cared for and shown 
what it is to be in a God-led relationship that they themselves will begin to pursue Christ and they will hear the knocking upon their door and they will invite him in. This happens way more often within relationship than it ever does by a preacher shouting or yelling or telling people they're going to hell or any of those things that have taken place in the past and will take place in the future. Yes, some may come to know the Lord in that manner, but not nearly as many as come when they are built into a relationship with others. So we must continue to have relationship as Paul and Silas have relationship with the jailer and now are creating a relationship with these magistrates. They assert their Roman citizenship so that the balance is restored. We too, in relationships that have an imbalance, must, must assert who we are, our birthright in Christ, so that there can be balance in the relationship. When somebody is trying to push us around, when somebody is trying to create within the relationship we have with them an imbalance so that they are the power in the relationship, it is up to us to reassert who we are into the relationship and say, I am a child of God, and because of that, I will not allow you to speak to me in this way or to behave in this way with me. That doesn't change how I feel about you. It doesn't change that I love you, that I'm praying for you, but it does change how I will allow you to approach me and to speak to me. It is important that we know who we are in Christ when we enter into relationships. God is always the lead. And two or more believers will be following, respecting, and honoring him and one another. So let's go back to the word. Acts chapter 16, picking up in verse 37. Acts chapter 16, picking up in verse 37. But Paul said to the officers, They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we were Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let, us come, let them come themselves and escort us out. Verse 38, the officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. Now that Paul and Silas has expressed, listen, just so you know, this is who we are, this imbalance has been shifted. They would wanted to just push this aside, treat them like anybody else, but Paul and Silas won't allow it. I want to now touch upon the second point in the sermon. Point two, soul saving supersedes our rights. Let me repeat that. Soul saving supersedes our rights. We see this in this scripture because the question must be begged to be asked, why did they not say they were Roman citizens before? They had the ability to say we were Roman citizens when the magistrates were yelling at them, when they were brought forth to the jail, when they were beaten, when they were put in jail, when they were put in the stocks. All of this time, they could have said that they were Roman citizens, but they didn't. Why? Because they understood that there was a reason behind what was going to happen. That reason is that souls are more important than rights. And we see this to be true because the jailer's soul was saved. He needed to be saved, and so them being Roman didn't matter at the time. As believers, we are faced with what we should do every day and how we should serve the Lord. At times, we get confused. When do we assert our given birthright? When do we put up a fight? And I must say that I don't have all the answers. I have what is written here before me, and I have what I have experienced within my own life. 
especially over the last four or five months. And I know this, that souls outweigh my rights. If I am uncomfortable, if I want changes, if I am hurting, but I hear or I see unbelievers coming, then I as a believer in Jesus Christ and you as a believer in Jesus Christ must pause and think, this might not suit me. This, not my, this might not be what I want, what I like. This not, might, might not be even what I am comfortable with. But souls always, hands down, outweigh rights. That's what we witness here. That they say silent. They take a beating They get imprisoned. They go through all of that when they didn't have to. As Roman citizens, there was nothing that these magistrates could have done to them. But they took it all because it's times like this that we must look at soul saving as much more important than our rights. And so the question gets asked, well then, Pastor, when is it time? When is it time that we fight for our rights? And all I can tell you is this. It's time when the Holy Spirit says it's time. Acts chapter 16, verse 40. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison... They went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. They left prison. Not being allowed to be swept under the rug as the magistrates would have wanted to say, oh, well, we'll just sneak you out. We'll just sneak you out of town and you can just disappear. And then we don't have to deal with the fact that we overstepped with you being Roman citizens. No, Paul and Silas said, you are going to walk us out of here and we're going to make our way to where we were called to be. We're going to go back to Lydia's house. And so after the magistrates have been put into balance in the relationship in which they have, though we're going to see that that balance doesn't last for very long, they find their way to Lydia's house where they finished what God had called them to do and they visited with these people and they encouraged them and they spoke to them and I'm sure there was another sermon that was preached to lift up their hearts to say, listen, we're going to be going, but God is with you. We know that as it is written that Luke probably stayed behind to continue to work with the church before he met back up with Paul uh, later on. And so we know that this This little church that was started means a lot to Paul and Silas and even more to God. Point three is this. Weird and wonderful is the church. Weird and wonderful is the church. In this very new church that we read here in verse 40, we see that Paul and Silas had a hand in it, but it was It was the work of the Holy Spirit. It is a a wealthy woman whose heart was gently opened upon hearing the truth. And this truth was given to her through the Holy Spirit and she accepted and and so did her household. And and then perhaps the demon-possessed medium is there as well. And, And we know for sure that the jailer who was on the verge of suicide, who saw these remarkable signs and, and then himself just threw everything he had into believing. and said, how, how do I come to know the Lord? And then his whole household through a promise given to God was given to God. And it is this amazing moment of this little church built of these individuals, which really isn't textbook if you are planting a church But the Holy Spirit went, this, this is good. Everyone who is listening, 
maybe it's listening live right now or, or maybe you're watching this some other time uh, throughout the week, I need you to know that the church is imperfect. As a family, we are weird and we are wonderful and at times we are this dysfunctional mosaic of personalities and stories. However, it has always been that way. The church has always been that. We see it here. It has always been weird and wonderful. And as long as we always keep God as the lead, this weird and wonderful family will always flourish and will always be giving up whatever we need to give up, whatever rights we need to surrender in order to bring one more weird and wonderful soul home. So what? Well, let's just review. One, seek out and maintain God-led relationships. It is of vital importance to you personally, to the church, and to those who you are leading to the Lord that you have God-led relationships in your world. Two, Soul saving supersedes our rights. Always will, always has. That is the way it is. We as a church have gotten comfortable in how we have done things. And there is times where God says, it is time to not be comfortable. It is time to take on whatever is given you and that you will have to push away the rights that you believe that you have, the rights that you have been given and you need to just push forward in new ways in order to reach the souls that God wants. Why? Because, number three, the church is weird and wonderful, always was and always will be. And I praise God for it because I am a weird and wonderful soul that was reached because somebody pushed aside what was comfortable what was right and sought out a relationship with me to speak to me, to tell me that God wants my soul. And they led me because of their relationships that I could see with others, that this was a safe space, that this was a safe place for me to tear down my walls and to say, yes, yes, I have been told about God my whole life and I never listened, but I'll listen to you. Tell me the story of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he saved my soul. Praise God. Let us sing.
of all names. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. You're the name Indeed, how great is our God. He is magnificent. I just want to say this briefly as we just go into prayer and close off our time together. If you are new to faith, if you are tuning into this for the very first time, welcome to the weird and wonderful. I want to pray for you. If you want to join the weird and wonderful world of, of church, of being a believer in God, of having a family in Ohana that will pray for you, then you just need to repeat after me as I pray. Then I'm going to close the service. Lord God, I surrender my heart to you. Guide me now, Lord, into God-led relationships. If there is an imbalance in relationship in my world, give me the strength to restore the balance through your name. Help me to understand in this moment right now my soul matters more than anything else in the world to you. I ask your forgiveness, God, for the sins that I have committed and I accept your beautiful grace into my heart. Lord Jesus, let us also pray for those who are in relationships right now, human relationships, where there is a sense of imbalance, where they are, where they are being pushed and shoved and hurt emotionally, physically, Lord Jesus, I pray that you pour into them, every single one of them who is listening to this, pour into them right now. Let them know that they are not alone, that the relationship that they are in is not proper, nor right, nor it is of you. Even if that relationship is with somebody who says they are a Christian, 
That is not how you treat us and it is not how we treat one another, Lord. And so, Lord God, I pray for your power, your grace, and your love and your protection to just be upon those individuals who are hearing this now and know that the relationship that they are in, be it romantic or platonic or with a family member, Lord Jesus, let them know there's a way out. Lord Jesus, for those who are being convicted right now because they know that they are the perpetrators of what I am speaking. Lord, I pray that you grasp their soul right now. That you hold them and that you tell them that they are loved. That what they have done is wrong, but that they are loved by you and that there is forgiveness and grace for what has taken place. Give them courage and strength to apologize to those they have hurt and let this relationship be born anew under the banner of the lead of you. We pray this, Lord Jesus. And in light of all of that, we thank you for the weird and wonderful church you built. We will never understand why this was the plan, but praise God it is. And you love us. In your holy and blessed name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you asked the Lord into your heart, please, I ask, go onto the website, firstnazarene.ca, and send us a message. You can go on Facebook and, and find me there or find our church page there. Send a message that says, I did this. And I want to know more about him and we are going to come alongside you, and walk with you and work with you because it is important that you are now in the journey of being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you prayed some of those other prayers, whether you are a victim or a perpetrator of, of what we have talked about here today, please feel free to do the same thing so that we can be praying for you, so that we can be walking with you. Because it is the goal of the church to help through the Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, and God the Father to create relationships that are balanced and good. God bless you. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how.